I've hit level 80 and now the rest of Guild Wars 2 is opening up to me. Three horizontal expansions, the whole mount system, fractals, masteries, a lot to do, a lot to progress. But what's more important today and what surprised me is just how much I have enjoyed the journey so far. Turns out what Guild Wars 2 shipped in 2012, in some ways, is still beyond what many games even try to do now. And when we last left off, I was milling around in the 30s. A lot has happened since then, including this. Yeah, turns out the world bosses are pretty damn big. Okay, there's a lot to get through today as I finish my journey to end game of Guild Wars 2. Let's go. Big picture, the journey continued as you'd expect for Guild Wars, right? Clearing maps, getting a new personal story chapter every 10 levels, and then just rinse and repeat till 80. Well, the thing is, as I climbed those levels, doing that just got more and more interesting. Where the personal story had been good enough, but maybe a bit more minor, it was now big. The zones themselves started to get more intricate. Suddenly I was doing multi-stage attacks on citadels just via events I'd bump into in the world. And all of this with outstanding music, atmosphere, and level design. The Guild Wars 2 leans more heavily on its open world than most MMOs, and it really does show. It's really great stuff. The quality just keeps rising, so let's get into it with the story. Okay, for the Mega TLDR, my character is established in the world, I end up joining the Order of the Whispers, and we've got the big looming threat of the undead dragon Zaitan. So, within the Order, I slowly go up the ranks, along with my mentor Tybalt, a very likable char. Now this big Zaitan threat is looming, but initially, it's smaller stuff. Spy quests, helping Quaggins, which are funny looking fellows. But all of that changes with the Battle of Claw Island, chapter 6 of the story. But to say chapter 6 out of 8 makes it sound like the Battle of Claw Island is near the end of the story. Well, the thing is, by runtime, that's not the case. Chapter 6 and 7 clock in at 4 hours between them, chapter 8 is over 4 hours alone. There is a boatload of content here, and the shocking thing is, it's pretty damn good. It turns out that Guild Wars 2 really can do spectacle. The Battle of Claw Island sees us get our arses kicked. It's pretty cool, you actually do feel the tension built. It finally makes that undead threat just feel real. And just when we think we're done, Lion's Arch, the capital, also gets attacked. And from there, we go into one of the best quests yet, a light in the darkness. It's a vision from the pale tree that sees us essentially glimpse the future and learn of Or, which is the first human kingdom of Tyria that fell kind of Atlantis style, only for Zaitan to raise it back up and use it as fuel for his undead. So at this stage, the story, the plot is ratcheting up, but also I'm getting more invested in the lore. There is more of a feeling of a rich sense of history, something you definitely get a lot more of if you're also aware of the plot of Guild Wars 1. So it's here that I start to feel ArenaNet actually flex, and we get to see a bit more of Traherne, who ends up being one of the more important characters in the story. But it's all quite cool. I mean, Traherne's got a really neat voice, some, some fun stuff there. We've got a vision sequency thing going on. I mean, those are always fun. But of course, right after that, oh shit, my order's base gets attacked. And then, with it defended, it's time to retake Claw Island in another big attack. So to boil down the content there, we get a big base defense that's really well themed, we get an upping of the stakes, a future vision, the rescue of our comrades, and a big offensive, all in one chain of quests. And that's what I like here. It is the story. There is very little filler. It's all fully voiced, and I think for sure some of their writing can be a little bit simple and clunky at times, but overall it does come together to be more than the sum of its parts. And then they do a great job with the likes of the sound effects, building the tension up. It is just a great experience. It's not some sort of heart-pounding thriller, but it certainly is enough to get you feeling immersed in Tyria and want to know what happens next. So mission accomplished. 
And there's even more here. There's a death or two, but I'll leave those for you to experience yourself. At this stage, I was grooving. Chapter 6 was finished, so it was time to go back out into the world. And this is where things continue to get better. Guild Wars 2's maps are bloody fantastic, and this time around, I even bump into a world boss, and that's really cool. So, the scale that they've achieved here is quite remarkable, not just in the world boss, but also in the breadth and scope and sheer size of the world. It feels damn good. Now, there'd be too much for me to just walk you through everything, so I'll give you the highlights. First variety. The undead swamp of Sparkfly Fen is really cool. We've got char on char action in Fireheart Rise, giving you more of a war vibe, and then the lovely winter getaway of Timberline Falls. The court area, which is how we refer to the content that's shipped in base Guild Wars 2, is all about doing the archetypes well. The Fireheart, I found, was particularly strong, though. Uh, the atmosphere, the sounds, the theming of the gameplay, it just perfectly captured the tenuous war position that these Char are in. And here is really where the zone mechanics of this game shine. Doing a renowned heart uh, in a base, only to see an event spawn nearby. So I do that event, but then that event leads me to finding a contested waypoint, which then I recapture from the opposing char to the friendly char. And then that leads me into a multi-stage event to take control of a mine. And then shortly after that, I come upon a bunch of char attacking a flame legion citadel. So again, I embark on a multi-stage event that ends up with me and a bunch of other players killing the big boss in the citadel cool. The best word to describe this is flow. Guild Wars 2's world perfectly guides you from place to place. Always happy to have you thinking, I want to do this POI, that POI, do this renowned heart, but then, oh, you bump into an event and your journey just happens from there. And that's how this game can be a total time vampire. And I actually do mean that in a very good way because you just feel immersed in these zones, immersed in the gameplay. And what I then love is some of the details, because while doing all of this, one thing that I start doing is keeping up a kill streak. because even without a booster, kill XP is actually great in this game, even at higher levels. Yeah, and a lot of that is because of this game's functionally infinite leveling. Of course, once you hit level 80, if you level again, you just get masteries, right? You just keep on filling that bar. And that means that they have no incentive to slow things down absurdly. And that just keeps every little bit of your gameplay feeling rewarding. And speaking of rewarding, well, Tacotl is just where the game shines. This is a World of Warcraft world boss, right? It's what I'm used to. Now this is a Guild Wars 2 world boss. It's pretty big, isn't it? Being my first time, this gameplay absolutely sucks. Almost as much as my frame rate, perhaps more. Hopefully they get the engine upgrades that they've been working on as this year rolls out. But still, from the entrance of this boss right through to its defeat, the spectacle is off the charts compared to what I am used to. We can talk about tight gameplay mechanics till the cows come home, and honestly, Guild Wars 2 is not the tightest. But a massive part of a game is in fact the fantasy. It's the sights, it's the sounds, it's the things your character does. This is a massive undead dragon, and fighting it does feel like me and a whole bunch of other people are fighting a massive undead dragon, not just a hitbox with health that happens to have a dragon model, so to speak. Even just the way it's animated, the way it moves around the world, it feels damn good. The mechanics are simple enough, there's a burn phase, and then a bit where the team just splits off to do multiple different objective defenses, and that's all assisted by jump pads. Of course though, if you fail those side objectives, you actually can lose. And this stuff all happens in a global timer too, so for many people, chaining world bosses is a very valid way to play this game. Of course, you get big boxes of loot in return. Not that I really understand what half their contents actually do at this stage. Soon enough, though, I was level 70. So it's time for the penultimate story chapter. Chapter 7 sees the three orders band together, forming the Pact, with Traherne as its leader and me as his number two. And with a mix of 
I'd say, Spec Ops style missions, and then the massive battle for Fort Trinity, this chapter delivers even more fantastic content. Seriously, the Fort Trinity segment does not mess around. You do have this looming feeling of a massive undead threat, and... Well, whenever hard military decisions have to be made, they don't shy away from that. And I don't mean this in some sort of, oh, the game is so edgy and cool. I mean, it just feels like actual things that have happened in this world. And that's good. You do actually get a sense that many people die at Fort Trinity, and that makes the Zaitan struggle feel like an actual campaign. And the thing is, they're not doing funny goofs and quips and, and stuff like that. They're actually sticking to their tone when they want to which modern games don't always do a great job of so i was very happy about that essentially it's serious enough that you actually will take the events in this world at face value and you will actually bother paying attention to the world the fort trinity battle didn't feel like a quest it felt like an event that happened in the history of this world that they're building strong stuff and it's about to get even better as I dive into my last segment of world content. With Fort Trinity safe, I decide to continue leveling, but I head south to Or, the fallen civilization resurrected by Zaitan. Here I find three zones full of exploration and struggle as the packed forces barely maintain a foothold. And the thing is, gameplay and map design reflects this. There are no renown hearts, the things that are analogous to a World of Warcraft bonus objective. A renowned heart is generally helping a local with a problem, but that doesn't really fit here. I've actually designed this so that the packed forces can be significantly beaten back with loads of the waypoints inaccessible. So these zones are all exploration, POIs, vistas, hero challenges, events, and those events are often multi-stage ones. And those are based off zone-wide objectives. So I soon find myself in a massive group of players helping packed forces reach a central control point. And that sounds like a very mechanical way of describing it. But the thing is, this is after I've seen loads of packed members die at Trinity, right? After I've been invested in this campaign, I now head out and I see the story actually reflected in how the maps ebb and flow with their different events. And what really sold me was just the music, the sounds, the layout. Or absolutely feels ancient. It feels like a fallen kingdom risen from the depths. In gameplay and in, in execution, in the sounds, in the sights. I think that it does achieve so much more than World of Warcraft's 2019 take on Najatar. And I think that's something we need to think about. Even at this early stage in 2012, Guild Wars 2 was showing us what a zone in an MMO can be, and to this day, very few have listened. And while this goes on, I finally learn how to play the game. Right, Elementalist, as I covered last time, it's essentially Avatar meets Mage, and it leans a lot more towards Avatar if you're in a double dagger build. Now, I finally started to use all of my Elemental stances all of the time. So I rush in with my air closer that turns me into like a moving ball of lightning. I then swap into earth, stacking loads of bleeds and blowing all my cooldowns. I then swap into fire to unleash all that it has, at which point I could pop over to water for a quick heal or wait a little bit and return to air and kind of repeat that process. All while I've of course got the other abilities that I can customize onto my character as well, like being able to just rain lightning, rain fire, summon an elemental. And the thing then is that swapping stances actually casts an ability based on how you've built your character and what stance you're swapping into. So when I swap into air, it casts a lightning bolt on my target. So it ends up being a highly engaging, high APM playstyle with a fair bit of positional depth, especially when you're weaving things around having to use your own dodges. Because, yeah, you see an enemy wind up to do a really big knockback attack, you hit the dodge key, you'll get iframes and you'll dodge it. Feels pretty good. Now, a lot of the positional stuff is just simple. As an example, I have a knockback in my air stance. And then I've got Churning Earth, which is a casted AoE that puts a massive bleed on. It just feels really cool. So it's pretty good to be in air stance, use the knockback, swap over to Earth, do the big AoE. 
It just feels great. And in that same sort of thing where in vanilla WoW, you would be just trying to avoid your enemy swing timer to get every ounce out of a limited amount of mechanics at your disposal, you actually do get that here with some of the positional gameplay. Now, Guild Wars 2 has got weaknesses, I think, when it comes to the clarity of hits, some sound effects, and some visual effects. But still, for Elementalist, it comes together brilliantly. And that just means I cannot wait to try advanced classes, especially the Weaver advanced class. Of course, all those advanced classes are their own things to level up, so that's going to be a reason to do a bunch of content. Which is fine. I'm level 80, but I've only cleared 33% of Corteria, so there's a lot to do. And now I draw things to a close. After immersing myself in the open world of Or, it was time to begin the final campaign. And I'm not going to spoil the whole thing here, but suffice to say, it was a mostly great four hours. The last mission had an annoying bug, and there are a few places where I think a bit more connective tissue could have been warranted. And honestly, the final fight with Zaitan, I thought was a pretty big letdown mechanically, even though spectacle-wise it was neat. But in spite of all that, it is an engaging narrative. You are going to the depths of this fallen civilization. It's just pretty cool. And while the Zaitan fight's a bit disappointing, the sheer scale and spectacle is on point. And because this narrative has been really well built up in the previous two chapters, you feel the weight of everything that's going on. They keep up the tone too. It's war. People die. You really feel like things have happened in the world. And they even finish it on a musical number. Now, sure, it's no flow, right? It's no dragon song. But it is a nice vocal track to cap off the story. And I really appreciate the effort there, to be honest. So all I can say is that where I am now, at the end of the personal story, I look at the UI and I see that I've got five living world seasons all full of narrative to do and three expansions worth of story. That is a massive amount of content in a game that is just cozy to play and all with no pressure. And really for a lot of people, I think that can just hit the spot. That's where I'm at with Guild Wars 2. I've got to say my initial impressions were strong and... I'm just thrilled that I can now sit down and say that it gets better and better as you go on. Um, there's one or two bits maybe in the middle where there's one or two zones that just, I began to feel a little bit slow in the pace, but seriously, once I hit like level 50, 60, 70, the narrative is, you know, picking up in pace, all that stuff. Man, you just get into the flow with this game and the hours evaporate. It's a goddamn time vampire. So I cannot wait to get involved in some of the more intricate maps that I've seen from, um, well, from looking at uh, Icebrood Saga be played. I can't wait to unlock more of the mounts. I only have a raptor, but there's way more. And I've got the masteries for my raptor to make it better. And then all the breadth of content that this game actually does have to offer. So hearing that players have doubled, that was pretty damn nice when I got to do that in the previous Guild Wars 2 video we did. It just makes me think, maybe in an MMO market where there's multiple successful games, i.e. people are playing, yes, World of Warcraft, but also other things, and maybe people are a bit more willing to play a few different games, maybe that's a market where Guild Wars 2 can actually do really damn well and where its unique strengths can stand out. I think this game is probably, probably very enjoyable for far more people than uh, I've even given it a shot. So there you go pretty damn happy time. I hope you found today's video to be interesting. Let me know if uh, you end up trying based on this. And till the next video, I'll see you later. And don't worry, there will be a next one because I'm in.